We have two very special guests on tonight, and these are my two close friends from Chicago, and we're just super excited to have you both on the webinar tonight. So first, I want to introduce Antigone Vesey. She's a physical therapist and athletic trainer and the current director of performance therapy at The Edge in Glenview, Illinois. And also she owns her own business called AV Performance Therapy. And a very neat thing, a very admirable thing about TIGS is that she's been published with her works on resistant training in young athletes. And that's what she's gonna touch on tonight. And I know I'm really looking forward to learning a lot about that. And I also want to introduce Mark Sitz, who is the owner of the Edge Sports Enhancement Training in Chicago. And Mark was actually my personal trainer all the way throughout my professional baseball career. So it was about 15 years that I got to work with him. And I have to give Mark a lot of credit because he was always way ahead of his time. When I was young in the minor leagues, there was no one foam rolling or doing muscle activations or movement preps, but it's those small things that kept me healthy and kept me on the field for about 15 years straight. And that's what gave me the edge on my competition as well. So I know I was just super grateful that Mark was such a huge part of my baseball career. So without further delay, Here's Antigone Vesey and Mark Sitch. Thank you, Rosie. So uh, I, it's not often that I get a chance to speak for Mark, but I will and say that I think we're both very excited to be here today um, and obviously appreciate Rosie for the opportunity. So today I'm here to talk to you about resistance training in youth. But as he mentioned, uh, I have my own company, AV Performance Therapy, and I'm working with Mark at the edge. and. Our relationship extends back when I was in high school and he was my personal trainer and kept me healthy throughout my career and into my adulthood and inspired me in the ways to look into this topic um, a little bit deeper because I appreciated the impact that it had on my life and also really wanted to, to share that with my patients. What is resistance training? Well, it's the act of a repeated voluntary muscle contraction against a resistance greater than those normally encountered in activities of daily living. Why do I define this? Because I want to make it clear that we're not talking about the sport of weightlifting or bodybuilding. Both of these are not recommended in the youth population. We're simply talking about adding some external resistance in form of training. So here are some facts. Uh, the first is that half of youth age 8 to 16 are participating in at least one organized sport per year, which is about 40 million youth. How many of them are getting injured? 20 million. Some research even suggests that there's more than that. So we look at the emergency department room facts, the amount of youth treated annually is 28 million visits. And we know that there are youth that are probably not going to the emergency room when they're getting injured. So I think this number is actually a lot higher. What is the leading cause of injury? It's actually sports. So when they look at this data, here's a list of in order, sports are number one, uh, accidental falls are number two. What is the percent of sports related injuries? 70% are in youth when we look at all sports related injuries that go to the emergency department. And how much does it cost? $1.8 billion. Sadly, these numbers have remained consistent over the past 25 years when they keep re rerunning these studies. Capacity to adapt to stress. It's theorized that the musculoskeletal system of the youth has a greater capacity than adults to adapt to stress. So it's theorized that maybe their um, their maintenance phase and their increased tolerance phase is greater. So you should be asking yourself, well, what's the problem, right? If we have a, an individual that has a greater capacity to adapt to stress, yet they are 70% of all the injuries that are going to the emergency department in the musculoskeletal system, the question is, uh, is it a rock problem or is it a them problem? And what I mean by that is if we think about the stress on our bodies, usually injuries are occurring for one of two reasons. Either the stress is too big or we're not strong enough to handle the stress that is being placed upon us. So this made me wanna look into this topic. So I had this clinical question, right? I was working at the high school level and I said, you know, for me personally, when I was working with Mark and when I had gotten stronger, um, I noticed that my performance improved and that I wasn't injured compared to my peers. But I really wanted to dive into the research 
So I said, you know, does resistance training improve athletic performance and or reduce injury rates in adolescents? So for my doctoral project, I did a systematic review on this. I also think there's some common beliefs. I've heard that parents would tell me, I don't want my kids to be in resistance training. It's going to stunt their growth or it's going to cause them to be injured. They really need to focus on their sport. I don't want them getting injured in the weight room uh, and affecting that. So I wanted to know if this was justified. When we think of EBP or evidence-based practice, these are the three things that as a clinician we're thinking about. We're thinking about the patient or parent values, clinical expertise, and the best research evidence. And we're combining these three variables to make a decision. So that's the way that we're going to look at this problem. So the patient or parent values are pretty simple, right? The athletes want to be stronger, faster, and better. And they want to not get injured as well. Looking at the evidence, is what we're gonna talk about right now. So when we think about the research on this topic, um, what I performed with the, and Mark was one of my co-authors, was a systematic review. What that is, if we think about um, the hierarchy of evidence, there's, there's levels. So at the lowest level is a case report, where I do something to one individual and I report on that response. It's very low level of evidence because we don't know if that would work on anybody else, right? The purpose of doing that level of evidence is to inspire a researcher to say, hey, that's super interesting. I'm gonna run a bigger study and I'm gonna take 50 people and I'm gonna see if that really does work or if that was a fluke. And a systematic review is where you take all of the randomized control trials on a given topic and put them together. So we know that each individual study might have some bias. This one might only be in baseball players. This one might only be in youth. This one might be in adults. This one might be with children, right? And so these studies have inherent bias, but if you put them all together, you can start to look at the bigger picture. A meta-analysis is where you actually take the data of all those studies and put it together. So that's why it's a little bit higher on this chart than systematic reviews. Um, but our study, because people were using different forms of resistance, meaning a band versus a weight, we couldn't compile that data because it wasn't the same. When we looked at injury risk reduction, um, there wasn't a single study that assessed injury rates. So what I mean by this is that if you really want to prove that something reduces the risk for injury, you have to assess it over time and say this group had less injuries than that group, right? Um, all the studies kind of used the transitive property and they said, well, we have studies to show that if you're stronger, you have less injuries and we know resistance training makes you stronger. So therefore, we can hypothesize that resistance training reduces your risk. This is something that I believe based on my clinical experience, but from a research perspective, um, not many studies actually went through the steps to say this definitively. There were two older studies that actually did do this. Um, one looked at a preseason resistance training program and found that over eight years, the number and severity of knee injuries reduced. And more excitingly, um, this other article looked at strength training on sports injuries and in high school students and said that if you were in the resistance train group, you are a fourth likely to get injured versus the non-resistance training group was 72.4% likely to get injured. So it's a huge difference. So that's an exciting study, but again, it's only one of them. Looking at athletic performance and fitness, these were the variables we looked at. Strength, which 13 studies measured. Power, which is how quickly can you move a load, 12 studies measured. Running speed, seven studies. Sports specific skill, six studies. Endurance, five studies. And so what I did here is put those results in graphic form so that you didn't have to go through and talk about all the details. But if we look on the left, these are studies one through 21. And at the top here is all the different variables. And if there's an area that's grayed out, it means that specific study didn't measure that variable, right? So study number one did not measure endurance, but measured everything else. All of the boxes that are in green showed a significant improvement in the resistance training group compared to the non-resistance training group. All the boxes in yellow here were no different or not significantly different. A lot of them were trending towards positive, but were not enough to statistically say. And only um, one result in two studies actually showed a negative result that it was significantly less. So what this visual is just showing you is that generally speaking, Resistance training is a very positive thing and is improving in all these different areas. Something that I think is most interesting is the sports specific skill piece, because a lot of times I heard parents say, well, you know, my child is a pitcher. He needs to be pitching because that's going to improve his ability to pitch. 
And I wouldn't disagree with that in the sense that if I want to learn how to play the guitar, I'm not going to pick up the trombone, right? But at the same time, these athletic skills are transferable. And so what's very interesting is how people's skills in their specific uh, sport improved without them actually working on those skills, likely because they now had more strength, power, endurance, et cetera. What was the program design? So across the board, the most successful programs were at least eight weeks. The frequency that was two to three times per week. The intensity was moderate, 60 to 80% of their one rep max. And even some of the higher studies where they, they put them in a high intensity did not do as well as the moderate intensity. So this is great news for two reasons. One is that you're probably more likely to get injured if you up the intensity. Um, and so knowing that we can kind of put the intensity in a moderate range and also improve our effect is exciting. But the most important thing is that this needs to be individualized because these are youth and they have different capabilities. The mode did not matter. So whether it was a band, whether it was a uh, free weight, whether it was a pulley, all produced the results. The exercises were both single and multi-joint, meaning sometimes they measured like a bicep curl, sometimes they measured a squat. Combination training was ideal. And so oftentimes they measured a group that was concurrently participating in their sport and doing resistance training versus a group that only did sports training and a group that only did resistance training and the group that was doing both actually did the best and rest needed to be about at least one minute between sets this is something that mark's going to talk much uh, more in depth about but this is just from the research kind of what i could pull to say this led to the best results injury from participation so that's the thing we hear all the time right well i don't want them to get hurt in the weight room well, their injury from participation was less than 1% compared to football being 28%, et cetera. So what I tell parents all the time um, is that, hey, if you're comfortable with your child participating in a sport, you should be you know, almost 20 times more comfortable with them being in the weight room. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that the forces in the weight room are much more controlled than on the athletic field, right? You are with someone, you can change the volume, you can change the variables, you can be supervised, you can be spotted, versus just being in an athletic scenario, things happen um, that are much more risky. So 77% of those injuries were accidental where the youth was dropping the weight on their hand or foot. So a much lower rate um, than adults. When we look at those injuries and we compare them to adults, again, you look at the accidental and children is much higher compared to adults, which makes sense. And where are those injuries occurring? Most uh, in the hand and foot in the child from dropping the weight versus in the adults, most likely in their low back, probably from poor lifting technique. So what the research really suggests is if your child is old enough to follow directions and be safe in that sort of environment, then they're old enough to begin resistance training. Usually they're recommending around eight, but they say even younger than that, um, if, you, if you feel comfortable that they could be appropriate. The gains in youth, so pre-puberty, the gains were mostly due to neurological development and coordination. So they did get stronger, but there was no significant change in muscle cross-sectional area. Also males and females were pretty much completely equal in the load and the percentage of increase. Post-puberty, the gains were also due to muscle hypertrophy. So males exceeded females in the magnitude of the load. However, they had a similar percentage of gains from lifting. What was super interesting to me and something that I really feel like we need to address is that oftentimes in these studies, when they were male only, the control group also got significantly better without doing anything at all, indicating that males naturally get stronger with time. And this did not happen in the female only groups. So I think that um, females are at a disadvantage because we don't have some of those um, hormones that naturally would allow us to put on more muscle mass and get stronger from time. And that's why I think we see a lot of uh, these vulnerabilities in female young athletes. Also, a couple studies measured detraining. So they said, okay, we, we strength trained for 12 weeks, let's do 12 weeks of nothing, and let's see how quickly we lose that gain. And what they found was that, yes, there was a regression in athletic performance. However, even at 12 weeks, that group was significantly stronger than the group that hadn't done any training at all. This is great for two reasons. One, this is not what we see in adults. So in adults, it's pretty even. If we do two weeks of work and we take two weeks off, we're probably gonna be similar level of performance. But this is saying that youth has a greater capacity to maintain those gains. So there's also a protective effect. 
So if you think about this as a preseason um, or off-season type of resistance training program, you can make the argument that those gains are going to last, you know, for three months with these studies uh, without any need for further resistance training. So now looking at my clinical experience, so I believe that this period of time is a rapid period of growth in these athletes and it leads to profound weakness. So what I think is part of the reason that we're seeing a high incidence of injury in this population is we're often grouping things by age. And I don't know that age is the best variable to compete against. We often see that in the professional youth sports or the club teams, there's lower injury rates. And we often describe that and say, well, they're better athletes and that's why they're getting injured less. And that might be the case, but I'm also wondering if it's because they're playing with people who are more appropriate and at their skill level. Think about how your kids move, right? They move awesome because they have to, because their head is about a third of their body weight. And so if they lean too far forward or too far back, they're gonna fall over. And so they have these perfect movement mechanics, but somewhere along the way, when they start to grow, I think that they lose that coordination and ability to move. Um, this is my nephew when he was three years old and we were just asking him to jump. And you can see he has a great hip hinge pattern here. The first thing he does is sit back into his hips and tries to jump and nobody taught him how to do this. Nobody said, hey, it's really good to move from your hips instead of bring your knees too far forward. But um, if I even looking at him now, he's nine now, he's already starting to change some of those patterns just because he's growing. So I think there is a place for us to be improving movement patterns in our young children to help them transition to a successful adolescent and adult life. Lastly, sports specialization, it's happening, right? People are saying as early as five or six years old, um, this happened because there was a lot of research to say, hey, if you participate in something for 10 years or you do 4,000 hours, you're going to become an expert at a much accelerated rate. So people were saying, well, hey, if we start them at five, then when they're 15, they're going to be awesome, right? Um, but there's little support of this really being positive in the literature. And my personal opinion is that most children under the age of 14 have not fully developed fundamental patterns of movement to be successful at any sport. Um, and I also think there's a loss of transfer transferable athletic skills. When I was working um, at the high school, a lot of times the three sport athlete was the athlete that was the best athlete. And we would explain that by, well, this is just an athletic individual. And I often wondered, or is this individual really being able to embrace different components of athleticism in these other sports that are transferring to the success in the other one? I also think there's a less likely chance of overuse or stress-related injuries because if you are performing different things or cross-training, if you don't like different sports, um, then you can change the stress on your body. And lastly, I wonder about the psychological factors of anxiety and coping with failure if you're only measuring yourself by one variable. Future research is needed, of course. You know, nobody will sit here and say that we have all the answers, but I'm putting this slide to show you that there is a ton of research on this topic. And so if there's any doubt about resistance training, um, it's been tested, you know, and for me to be able to do a systematic review means that there's a ton of literature out there. So um, I think that we can feel very confident that it's a great thing and that um, we just need to think about how to implement it and the, the barriers of implementation. So the clinical bottom line here for me is if a child's old enough to participate in a sport, they're old enough to begin resistance training. There's really a low risk from participation, less than 1%. It will increase their athletic performance and skill. It may reduce their risk for injury. I believe it does, but again, we have to look at those studies that actually measure that. Uh, I think it counter affects the effect of rapid growth. It's much more efficient. So a lot of these studies show they had one pitching study where they measured workload and they said, hey, we're gonna give one group a baseball, we're gonna give one group a one pound ball, we're gonna give one group a three pound ball, and they changed the pitch counts based on the weight and found they increased their strength to the same degree. So for less reps, you can get more um, benefit. But the biggest thing is we have to treat these athletes as individual because age is just not really a good predictor of where they're at develop, uh, developmentally. And so um, I think oftentimes we throw these gross programs out there out there and it's it's good because it allows a lot of people to participate but it's it could be too much stress for some and not enough stress for others and uh, it's not the most efficient way if you're not looking at each person as an individual i just wanted to end with this quote because i think it's a powerful one we should be far less concerned with our current performance 
and far more concerned with our current trend. And I think in the youth sports arena, we are um, still trending in the direction of this being a highly injured group. And some of those injuries are career endings when they don't have to be. And, and youth sports are there to set these individuals up for adulthood. And I personally believe that my work with Mark and my work in high school athletics and in, and in college has set me up to be a healthy adult. And that's an opportunity that I, I feel we really need to embrace in this population. So my question was, talk about trends. Have you seen like a positive trend in people like accepting this resistant training at a younger age since you've been doing it, since you started it? Has it gotten better? Have people been like, yeah, actually, I'll, I like that. Or is it kind of like the same? It depends. I mean, I, I see that there are still the parent and coach out there that is very sports specific driven. And that's because that's their wheelhouse. And there's nothing wrong with that. I see the exact opposite. I mean, generally speaking, I think parents are getting smarter. Um, and I think that they're doing things like participating on this webinar, right? Things like that, because they want to be informed um, and not just taking some anecdotal word as gospel. But uh, I do still think there's stigma. Like when I tell my family, hey, you know, I know that my nephew's nine, let's get him in some, you know, let's get him in some sort of program. They're like, that's crazy. He's just nine years old. And I'm like, that's the perfect time, right? So it's a, it's a challenge. And I think we just got to keep um, preaching the word. Yeah. I mean, I think like the number, the key was those improving those movement patterns are huge uh, as soon as possible. Cause I know that was huge for my career in baseball as well. But take, thanks so much. So now Mark, Mark Sitch coming from Chicago as well. Um, Mark, if you guys didn't join earlier, Mark is, was my trainer for 15 years straight. So from once I started professional baseball, I was a wreck. And Mark, Mark could probably tell you this, the same thing, but he helped me identify these movement patterns and not only helped me uh, improve them, but helped me understand. Like he educated me to understand so I can do it on my own as well. I can take it from working out with him in Chicago and go to Oakland uh, to play in the Major League Baseball season. But Mark, here's Mark Sitch. Thanks, Rosie. Thanks, Tiggs. Um, there's a, can everybody hear me, by the way? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, there's a lot of different tangents that I can go on based off of what Tiggs said and what Rosie just said there. So I'm going to kind of try and stay somewhat focused. But um, yes, I've known both Antigone and, and Rosie for about 15 years now. I'm not, I'm the reason why Rosie didn't do better in his career because I was kind of holding him back on everything. Um, no, but seriously, um, what you have there with Antigone is someone, I know most of us are kind of in the trenches. We're coming from athletic backgrounds. We're maybe not spending as much time in academia. So when Antigone came to me and said, I want to do a systematic review, I'm like, what the hell's a systematic review? Um, and it required a lot of reading and a lot of uh, information. And what she did to go through that and actually prove something that was um, empirically known in the trenches. You know, we, we talked about this, that coaches and trainers are kind of on the forefront of everything and then academia wants to get a hold of it and then prove it so if anybody has any qualms about whether or not resistance training uh, can have a negative effect on on, on youth and kids it, it's a really 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 extreme sample size of people that do that that's the traditional like well if you lift weights you're going to get too big um, that's not that's not true um, it's one of those things where she has gone through the efforts to prove to people that resistance training does work. It's what I've seen in my career for almost uh, 19 years now. It's what I've seen working with kids from as young as 11 years old all the way to adults at as old as 86. And it really does come down to the fact that there's um, some fundamental concepts and it's really, really, really not that complicated. Um, everybody knows that eating their vegetables is good for them but we're trying to find that one vegetable that's the magic vegetable that's going to make everything better. Well, don't overthink it. Just eat your freaking vegetables. It's, it's kind of what it comes down to that is there's, there's, simpli there's, so there's profundity and simplicity, and we're going to kind of talk about those scenarios. But at the end of the day, what it really comes down to is with resistance training with youth is we're trying to develop good habits and good patterns. Um, getting sports specific is, is a disease that has been affecting kids from, that are currently playing. I'm 42 years old. I was a high school and collegiate athlete. It's what I experienced back in the day and it's what's been passed on from generation to generation. Sports specific skills come from coaches 
And those are sport coaches that teach the specific aspects of what is needed for that particular um, demand of, of that position and the position within the sport. What we need to look at from a training perspective is, is we're trying to get kids to just generally move better. As, as Tiggs alluded to, babies move great, and then all of a sudden we get stronger and the forces of how the musculoskeletal system works ends up screwing things up. We adapt to sitting. Uh, we adapt to whatever environment we're in. We're, we adapt to repetitive motion. So if you continuously do repetitive motion, and if you're talking about baseball particularly, um, most athletes in baseball only rotate one way. They don't rotate the other way. They only throw with one arm. They don't throw with the other arm. So we're creating a lot of asymmetries that, that come along with, with the sports-specific demand of it. Um, when we get to talking about kids, we, we really get to the scenario of just understanding and creating fundamental movement patterns and making sure that they're really good at them. And this can happen even at a younger age than 11. It, it starts as early as three, four, five. I mean, when you take a kid and you throw them in gymnastics just so they develop motor control or you tell them to go to camp and they're running and playing and so on and so forth. These are still forces that are happening on a kid's body. So these are forces that need to be appreciated with acceleration, deceleration, and change of direction, but they're informal. They're not structured with rules because adults are the people that like rules. Kids like play. Um, the younger a kid is, and when we get below youth scenarios, you know, we're talking five, six, seven, eight, so on and so forth, it should be considered play. It should be fun. If you try and impose adult rules onto a kid at that age, you're just going to make them hate you and they're going to not really have great retention to it. But as we get a little bit older, that's when we can get a little bit more sports specific with the coaching side of it and also get movement specific with the training side of it. For example, um, when we have our junior high, junior high athletes that come to work with us, they move like poo. They, it, it's just terrible. It's what Tig showed with that young lady who was just moving around like a baby giraffe. And then all of a sudden they start getting their neural patterns better and they start moving better and they start getting stronger, but they're not actually adding mass. They're just improving neuromuscular efficiency. They're getting better at a fundamental movement pattern. And then all of a sudden I get a phone call from the mom, you know, wondering why, you know, Patty's vertical is so much better and he's crushing it on volleyball. It's because his movement patterns are getting better. He's not at a point where he can actually develop muscle, but he's just getting more efficient with things. Um, some of the people that I have to really, really, really regress are people like Adam. Every time Adam came to me from an in-season, he moved horribly. His movement patterns were absolute poo. I actually had to regress everything all the way back to the beginning and clean things up in order for him to move better so we can progress and actually put load on a better movement pattern. Because if I loaded a bad movement pattern, um, that's just accelerating the rate of injury. So resistance training isn't bad it's the application of a resistance training to whatever the movement pattern is and whatever however the individual is moving so that's something to take into account what i wanted to go through in this presentation and some of the slides i'll go through pretty quickly but um uh, who am i i'm a strength and conditioning coach um i have international youth conditioning association performance enhancement specialist i went to u of i blah 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 basically i've got 19 years in the industry working with thousands and thousands of people in our facility right now we've got a 7,000 square foot facility where we work with everybody and anybody and the, the 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 real reality is is that everybody is still human everybody still has a, a, a an anatomical structure that's basically the same it just so happens that if you try and put it towards one particular skill quit trying to find that one perfect exercise or that one perfect scenario that's going to separate you from everybody else master the things that are simple. So fundamentally move well. And if you don't fundamentally move well, don't, uh, I would say, I encourage you to, to have the vulnerability to admit that and then have the ability to, to fix it. So the first thing we, we do is assess. We just want to talk to the, we want to talk to the kid, figure out what do you have to deal with? What are your performance goals? Um, how long is your season? What level are you, uh, what level are you playing at? Are you injured? You know, have you had a medical history? Let's take a look at the way that you move. Um, let's evaluate this thing, compartmentalize it, and then put it into a situation where we can we can solve solve some problems. Um, performance demands: What position do you play? Are you a pitcher? Are you a hitter? Are you a, a, a ten-year-old? Are you an eighteen-year-old? Are you a twenty-five-year-old? What's your season like? Are you playing travel? Are you playing house league? These are all things that we take into consideration. 
what are your goals? Are you trying to throw faster? Are you trying to run faster? Are you trying to hit? Are you, are you, are you, are you pulling out as you're trying to hit a slider and you, you can't, that pitch is getting you out every single time. So do you need to loosen up your hip in order to get to that pitch? Right, Adam? At that point, what it comes down to is uh, evaluating what the situation is and what the goal of the individual is. The younger the individual is, the more broad it is. We just want to develop well-rounded, good athletes. Um, if I have someone coming to me saying that I've got my son or my daughter who's a softball player and we want to work on pitching mechanics and the kid's 12 or 13, I'll politely tell them that kid just needs to get stronger. You know, that's really what it comes down to. And a lot of times we'll actually train the opposite side because that's where a lot of the injury comes from is, is some of the decelerative, decelerative factors that come into it. Um, injury. Um, yeah, we got joint issues. We got arm, back, knees, soft tissue issues from hamstrings and calves and obliques and lats. Uh, you got other stuff that people don't think about, you know, from diabetes and asthma and heart issues, concussions, ADHD. All these things are things that we have to take into account and evaluate what the medical history is. Most people know about what Tommy John is, um, and this is not going to be a lecture on Tommy John, but if you take a look, there's a large number of people in the major leagues that right now that have Tommy John based off of stats from 2016. Um, it's kind of a disturbing trend, especially now that people are actually starting to get Tommy John surgeries prior to the injury, knowing that they're going to get it. I'm, I'm not as research oriented as, as Tiggs is or some of the academics out there. And by the way, Tiggs is on the other hand is in the trenches with us uh, quite a bit as well. So it's not just, she's not all academia folks, but what it comes down to is there has to be something that we can focus on to make a better cohesive unit versus figuring out what's going on with your UCL. Um, we talk about posture. And posture is just not the thing that your mom or dad yells at you to do that you do for like five seconds until you get tired and then you're like, screw it. Um, posture really does have some good value to it. And when we evaluate posture, what we try and express is the way that the body moves is you have three basic subsystems. You have your shoulder girdle, you have your pelvic girdle as displayed here, and you have your feet. The way that these three subsystems interact with each other determines how efficient your athletic movement is. So if you have one system that's gone wonky and is misaligned, you can make the assumption that there's going to be bad movement patterns that are going to go up the chain and down the chain. So the thing we're going to look at first is we're going to look at the hips because the hips are, are the basis of all athletic movement. Your butt, your glutes, this is where you generate force. This is where you generate uh, ground force reaction. This is where you generate rotation. So we got to make sure that if you're not moving well, we need to correct this. So this is, uh, this is Adam from a couple years ago. If you wanna take a look, his right hip is gonna drive into his left hip. Um, you can basically see how much force is going and driving into that left hip, okay? If that left hip does not have the ability and the musculature doesn't allow that hip to rotate, what's gonna end up happening is, is he won't be able to rotate from his hips and another joint's gonna take over and another joint's gonna take over. And you're gonna have something that looks like a baseball swing, but it's gonna be compromised because it's gonna have inefficiencies. So one of the things that Adam and I worked on early in his career is that he had always had a tight hip and we'd always talk about making sure that his hip moved better. And that in, in turn made him stronger at the plate and made him uh, less susceptible to injury. We talk about separation and the, the fancy word is, 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 is uh, disassociation between your top half and your bottom half, basically making that X to get that rotation in there. Well, if something's rounded over, uh, it's, it's like trying to rotate around an axis of rotation that's bent. It won't be able to rotate. And so that's where you're gonna get someone who swings all arms or is their feet are spinning out from underneath them. So we wanna really make sure that the mid back is an area of high concentration to get stronger. So the musculature can support the spine so it has the endurance and it has the ability to create that energy transfer. Uh, your feet, most people only care about their feet based off of how good their shoes look on their feet, but at the end of the day, your feet are the tires of the car. For most sports, they're the only thing in contact with the ground, and if you got jacked up feet, you know that you're gonna have an issue. Um, so we definitely look at, at, at feet. Also, 25% of the bones approximately in your body are in your feet. Um, they are very dynamic. If your feet are being neglected, that's a really, uh, it's a really big issue. So 
if you're flat footed, it's going to cause issues at the hip. And actually it's, it's actually the other way around. The hip is actually what's causing what's going on at the foot, but that's a discussion for a different day. Um, once we evaluate and assess the three things that are going on from the body, we want to correct. So we want to correct and understand that muscle tissue, as you get older, ends up getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And are you playing with spam or are you playing with fillet? We get into concepts of soft tissue work and myofascial release, and these concepts are designed to improve muscle tissue quality so your movement patterns are better. If you don't improve muscle tissue quality, your movement patterns are not going to be good. Um, we want to take a look at asymmetry. This is another gentleman that I know. We can take a look at his left leg to start off with and his ability to load his hip and get power out of there. Adam, this is a long time ago, huh, bud? This is the right leg. I think you guys can see that there's something different there. But yet, when he walks or when he runs, he uses right leg, left leg, right? He uses them. Uh, synergistically. He doesn't just use one leg over and over and over again, but this is a byproduct of repetitive motion. We want to correct those asymmetries. So without going into too much detail on this, we really look at joints that either if it's designed to move, it should move. If it's not designed to move, it should not move. So if a joint that's designed to be stable is surrounded by, or let me rephrase this. If a joint that's designed to move becomes too tight and doesn't move, it's gonna create the stable joints above it and below it to move more, which is then gonna result in an injury. So this is where resistance training, improving patterning, improving just general function is gonna reduce the risk of sometimes the musculoskeletal as well as the, the bone injuries. Strength training. Um, it's what Tiggs alluded to, and we can skip this one, but basically you're not trying to be a power, you're not trying to be a power lifter, you're not trying to be a bodybuilder, you're just trying to get some level of resistance so your body can respond to that. That's the stress that we look at that's a good form of stress. It's not distress or emotional stress, it's you stress, which is positive stress that it creates adaptation and change. Um, these are the different types of strength that we try and achieve, whether it's general force production or speed strength or power, endurance, motor pattern strength, stability strength. These are all different variables of strength. Strength is not just binary. Okay. Um, when we talk about training, we talk about, we do lower body training, we do upper body training and we do core. Okay. We don't use machines because there's no machines out on a playing field. So we want to move three dimensionally through time and space. We want to make sure we also get into unilateral and bilateral lower body and put a bias for our, our, particularly for our overhead athletes and baseball players on back work. Get away from the bench press, okay? Get away from doing things overhead. Focus on pulling, focus on getting your back stronger. You can't have a strong enough backside. Effectively, if you, if you can't see it in the mirror, that's the area that you should be training. Okay? If you can see it in the mirror, it really probably doesn't need to be trained that much. Okay. When we talk about core strength, um, at this point, in my opinion, you should never ever be doing a sit up. You should never ever be doing a twisting movement. Okay. The reason why we have core and why we have abdominal, uh, abdominal muscle musculature is because it's not a force producer. Your force production comes from your hips pushing through the floor, your abs are a transfer area. Once that, once that energy has been generated by your legs and it has to get to your hands holding a bat or throwing a ball, it goes through the core, okay? And if the core is weak, it ends up leaking. And so that's where we wanna really focus on our core work being a, an area of transfer and an area of stability rather than creating an area of movement. So most of the core stuff, actually I'd say probably 95% of the core stuff that we do is a force acting onto the body that the body then has to hold stable against. It's not easy, but anything that involves movement of you know the Russian twist and throwing balls around, uh, crunches and sit-ups, um, that's, that's not something that we would really recommend. Um, these are some of our high school kids. Uh, this is strength. So we're just doing a deadlift, okay? This is the ability to generate force. When you add speed to it, such as pushing a sled quickly or doing a, a, a single arm snatch, once you add speed to something, that's now power. A very simple way of looking at power is this. If you are athletic and you wanna succeed, if you are strong, but you are not fast, you are not powerful. If you are fast, but you are not strong, you are not powerful. In order to cash in, you have to have both speed and strength in order to be powerful. 
So evaluate, and that's what we'll do is evaluate. Is this person too strong? Is this person too fast? What do we need to do to, to kind of fill up the empty buckets? Uh, conditioning is something that's talked about. Uh, conditioning sucks. Everybody hates it, but it's really important because if you fatigue with conditioning, your muscular system shuts down and all of a sudden you get droopy and you get tired and your mechanics go. And when your mechanics go, especially in overuse situations, that's where you're more susceptible and vulnerable for an injury. Um, distance running and steady state cardio for baseball players is not anything we would ever, ever, ever recommend. Intensity is key. If, you, if, if in, a, in a baseball game, if you have four all-out sprints, you had a really good game. There's no reason why a baseball player or a softball athlete ever needs to go for a mile run or do any type of long-term long repetitive state cardiovascular work. So it's about work capacity. It's about intensity. It's in about recovery. This is really important. Uh, this is towards the end of, end of this for me, but uh, this is really, 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 really important. I will preach this until the day that I'm done doing this job. And this is something that I really had to um, explain to Adam early in his career because Adam was probably one of the hardest working athletes, if not the hardest at working athlete I've ever worked with, is that I had to pull Adam out of the cages. If he woke up, he wanted to be in the cages and hitting and hitting and hitting and hitting hundreds, if not thousands of baseballs. And it's not about quantity, because if you get to quantity, eventually you're going to fatigue and bad mechanics are going to set into place, which is going to lead to a greater risk of injury. Additionally, how do you know what you did differently between rep 37 and rep 84 and rep 125? What, what analytical and, and thoughtful process are you putting into this by doing more reps? More is never, ever, ever, ever going to be better. It's always going to be about better quality reps. And this also comes from, you know, in, in my opinion, to all you coaches out there, put your athletes out there when it matters in good situations and don't just be throwing them out there into every tournament that you could possibly put them into, uh, especially in the developmental stages of things. I know that you want to make kids happy and have them play because play is fun and that's what kids do. But paying attention to the fact of what they need to do to develop, to be able to play at a level versus just going out and playing. You can't have dessert all the time. Sometimes you do have to eat your broccoli. Okay. But being aware of your reps is what really, 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 really matters. And putting in good quality, purposeful reps is important. So again, I want to thank Adam. I don't want to thank Tiggs. I want to thank all of you for, uh, for listening to us talk. I'll hand it back over to Adam. And if anybody has any questions, uh, fire away. Mark, thanks so much, man. So what I got out of, out of what Tig said and what Mark said, the, the common denominator is understand yourself. And as parents and coaches, you guys have to understand your players to get them what they need. Uh, it took me a long time to understand myself. I go back to think about what Tig said about if you take two weeks off or something, it takes about six to eight weeks to get back. Like for me, that was my arm. My arm always gave me issues going back to spring training because I, I had to realize that now it's a longer season. I can't come off the off season and just throw bullets all the time. So I had to understand myself. And I think that's what um, Tiggs and Mark really hit home on. But we're going to open it up to questions now. I see uh, JT, if you just want to unmute yourself, uh, I see you had a great question about the front rack position. Can you hear me? Yeah, JT. Okay, yeah. I Just curious about that particular question. I've seen a lot of people that are proponents of the front rack, particularly in doing cleans, barbell cleans, right? Such, a, such an explosive movement. But just the front rack position in general, whether you're doing front rack lunges, front squats. Are you, are you a talking clean. about a front squat or are you talking about a hand clean grip? I'm talking about a hand clean grip. So – we don't have we don't have any that's a good question we don't have any of our overhead athletes do any hand clean grip the risk versus reward continuum on that is just putting stress on the hand and the wrist um, especially as the athletes get older it's it's also something they don't really feel comfortable doing it's it's uncomfortable it's uncomfortable and even though it's it's not going to be detrimental it sometimes takes the focus away we will we gladly do a front squat position on people if that's warranted and they have the so, ability to put the bar in front. It, sorry, not to cut you up, but just when you're saying the front squat, are you guys gripping it with 
your arms crossed to the opposite shoulder and not with the full grip on the bar? Or how do you vary your grip for hang clean grip versus a front squat grip? Yeah, so hang clean grip would be getting your fingers underneath the bar and getting your elbow up, which gets the wrist into a lot of extension. And if you don't have yeah. that wrist mobility, it can be kind of uncomfortable for, for a lot of individuals. For me, it's just not the risk versus reward isn't there. And a lot of times people will cheat that with the shoulders and not getting the rib cage up into the position. We'll, as far as I'm concerned, whether with the bar position, whether you're squatting, split squatting, whatever it might be, we coach, we prefer ideally to coach a front squat, but we're not married to that idea. We will we'll back squat and we also have safety squat bars, so yoke bars. Yeah. Where it's it really depends on it really depends on the individual's ability to get t-spine extension and if they have the ability to get proper t-spine extension we can coach them up with the bar in front we never have them hold on to the bar the minute they hold on to the bar they're activating their fingers and they want to grab it and they'll lose tension on the back side so we'll actually go open hand or we'll even go straight out with it um okay but if, if an athlete doesn't have the shoulder range of motion um and the retraction of the scapula we won't force them into a back squat. We will progress it to a safety squat bar. So it really, that's part of the assessment process and just figuring out what the right variation is. Because at the end of the day, if I'm banging my head against the wall to try and get someone to do a front squat and they're just not getting it, I'm losing time. I'm just training their lower body when I can just go put them on a yoke bar and they can still benefit from getting strength on the lower body while we use a different technique to work on whatever upper body mobility they may need. Yeah, absolutely. I I just read some stuff that some people are making the assertion that so sounds like you're more concerned with the wrist mobility, the fingers, whereas I had read a lot of stuff around the elbow and sort of two opposing views. Some people saying that that hang clean grip in the front rack position could actually create some level of strength around the UCL in the elbow area that would support it. And then other people that say, which were saying it would strain it and could make you more vulnerable. So just, just curious, but that, yeah, it's a great explanation. I appreciate I'm gonna, it. I'm going to touch on that. And I might toss that one to Tiggs as well a little bit. Um, here's what it really comes down to keep it simple, stupid. So if you think, if, if we're thinking that, if we're thinking that um, a hand clean grip is going to work on it, a UCL, that's maybe not really the smartest thing out there. It really does come down to the fact that I like simple things. I like to make my life easier. So if I'm coaching an athlete, I like something that they're going to get and has a, have a positive experience out of it. And if I'm fighting someone on a hand clean grip, that juice stick isn't worth a squeeze. I'll throw it to yeah. Tate if she could shed any light on the UCL with the hand clean grip, but I think that's going to be poo. Uh, JT, I have two answers to that question. So in regards to the UCL ligament specifically, all ligaments, if you apply stress to them, will increase their tensile strength. So if we took a pitcher's UCL and we took my UCL, they're going to have a thicker UCL than mine because that ligament's getting load put on it. Um, I don't believe it's a wise decision to try to add more load to a ligament though. That would be like, I want someone to prevent an ACL tear. So I'm just going to try to tear their ACL so that it gets strong. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Right. It, so yeah. it's, it's why is that injury happening? And the injuries aren't happening because the UCL ligament is not strong enough. The UCL, the injuries are happening because of another reason. And then my second thought on that is similar to Mark. When we think about having athletes move better, um, what the research shows from a motor learning standpoint is you want the internal cues of the athletes to beat the external. So what I mean by that is if we're trying to teach someone to juggle, we don't say, okay, you're going to bend your elbow to 90 degrees, you're going to bend your wrist, you're going to release your hand. We draw them into an external cue of can you grab the ball here and that's going to increase their skill. When I think of the front squat grip, um, the hand clean grip just allows more cueing to that patient externally, um, which is more likely that they're not going to get the point of the exercise versus the front squat. If they're not allowed to touch that bar, if they start to lean forward, that's going to fall forward and that's going to cue them. Nope, don't do that. If they start to lean back, that's going to choke them. That's going to cue them. Don't do that. So I just think it's a better way to teach a squat pattern in the youth athlete because they can't compensate with other things and they're getting some better internal cues. Tiggs, I'm going to springboard on that and I'm going to add on to the fact that we try and make things as idiot proof as possible. So when we try and make things idiot proof, what it comes down to is 
is that you should get immediate feedback whether or not you're doing it correctly or incorrectly. And my job ultimately is to try and get something to be as hard as possible with the lightest weight possible first. So I wanna develop that strength before we get all sexy by throwing as many plates and as many wheels on the bar as possible. So when we do a front squat, the reason for the front squat has nothing to do with the arms, but because the load is in front of your spine, if you were to lean forward, that bar is gonna fall forward and you're gonna get immediate feedback whether or not you're doing it correctly. Think about this scenario for anybody that's ever been in a weight room and taken or seen someone put a bar and do a back squat and do a really, really, really crappy back squat. You can still execute the movement, but because the mode that you chose to do it is allowing you to execute it poorly. By doing a front squat pattern, that cleans that pattern up and the athlete is gonna immediately feel like, oh, well, that's not right. And they have to neurologically figure out what the right pattern is. It really, it comes from the inside out. Uh, I told Adam I wouldn't swear on this, but I'm going to. Think about shit runs downhill, okay? So it all starts with the internal and the shoulder and it runs down the arm. It starts at the hips and runs down the legs. And you basically have a tube that connects both of these two scenarios. So the thought process should be less about what's happening at the actual elbow. And it should really be talking about what's going on in the shoulder and its interaction with the driver, with the scapula and with the rib cage. Because if you're looking UCL and elbow, elbow, elbow all day, but this kid or this athlete is rounded over and their shoulder blades are winging out on the back, it's not really an elbow issue. It's actually a shoulder issue that was the most likely precursor to what the elbow then had the stress from. Hey, uh, JT, um, can you guys hear me? Yep. Um, just to add on to that, I've tried that, um, that hang clean grip. And I, I was a left-handed pitcher, played for a little while. Um, and I would never recommend that to anybody because I always thought my elbow was about to explode. Yeah. I'd rather pitch than have than do a hang clean grip squat. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think Tig's analogy was perfect, right? Like why add additional stretch stress to that ligament? So that's awesome. Thank you guys. You're welcome. Adam, can I answer Devin's question here? Sure, thank you, yeah. Uh, so in the chat, she wrote, at what age can you males start resistance training with weights? I've heard weights can manipulate growth plate development if the child is too young. So the, that rumor got started because of child labor studies. So they had people in foreign countries who were having children lift very heavy loads, sometimes 100 to 200 pounds um, at the ages of you know pre- um, pre-puberty and they did have stunted growth and so the important and so then we extrapolated that and we were like okay weightlifting now stunts your growth the fact of the matter is that in all of these studies that i mentioned that i've read um and i've read too many to count and none of them had stunted growth many of them uh, talked about that variable and actually two studies looked at bone development and found that the bone density of those children were higher and so if we think about fractures being one of the leading causes of um, injury in youth, because oftentimes their muscular system is a little bit stronger than their bone development as they're growing, uh, there's an argument to be made that adding load will improve resistance training. Uh, sorry, improve bone health. So I don't think that worrying about um, the growth plate is a realistic concern if you're loading them appropriately. Again, they have good mechanics. We're not talking about putting three times someone's body weight on them. We're talking about just adding some resistance and continuing to progress that as tolerated. Yeah, Mark, I like what, what you said about uh, take the least amount of weight and make it difficult to move. Like when, I come, when I come back after a, after a long season, I, yeah, I'm a wreck. And it took me a little while to understand it. I'm going to have to not really lift weights for like the first two weeks. There's hardly any load. And I am so sore after going through those first two weeks, but it just takes some time, even though I'm not lifting weights, I'll get to the, the plates a little bit later, but usually it's not too heavy. It's moving properly and loading it, putting yourself in a, in a really tough position or in the, in the right position to, to lift, to understand that. What it, what it comes down to is again, is just trying to give, trying to give the individual feedback immediately as to whether or not they're doing it correctly, simply by putting them in a particular position. Um, I also want to elaborate, on how Tig's uh, answered the question about the growth plates and so on and so forth. 
that would be the thing, the fact that resistance training is going to stunt a child's growth is like the earth is flat. Some people want to believe it. And if you tell them that it's not flat, they want to believe what they want to believe. It's just something that's not going to happen. Um, when kids are playing sports, the forces that they're experiencing with change of direction, deceleration, acceleration, trying to generate velocity in quite possibly in a, in a, in a very aggressive and very dynamic way, it's kind of like thinking strength training and, and working with a professional is kind of like driver's ed. Even though you might be going a little bit faster and you may not be very good at it, you know exactly what cones you're going to drive through. You know where you're going to stop. You know where you're going to turn. So you know exactly what's going to happen and you practice getting to that point. So when you get out into the real world and if someone jumps out in the middle of the street, you have the ability to hit the brakes and have that force generation, but you have that practice and, 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 and repetitive nature to it. Um, sports actually produces a lot more forces on the body than anything resistance training would be. And the resistance training, you know, it, we're starting to get out of that ideological belief system, but it, it's not going to stunt growth. It's not going to affect anything. And if it does, it's usually because it's a really, really, really extreme situation with someone doing something very, very, very inappropriate um, with programming of, of training. My question uh, is, you guys have mentioned movement pattern training programs. Um, are there resources for those of us who aren't in the Chicagoland area um, who want to start that, uh, particularly with those younger age groups? Yeah, there's a lot of information out there. I mean, this, this is not a solicitation on our side of stuff. I, we have launched um, an internal online training program that we're actually going to be launching out to people who are truly remote. Um, it's something that we've had to do as a, it's something we wanted to do, but to do it as a byproduct of the current pandemic that we're in. Um, but there is a lot of information out there. There are a lot of really great strength coaches out there that are, that are sharing good information. Um, I can think about, I mean, one of the guys that I know, Eric Cressy, who's now the Yankees uh, strength and conditioning dude. Um, I don't believe he's got, he doesn't have a program per se, but I know he does online training if you want to work on an indiv individual basis. I'm sure I haven't looked at it, but I'm sure there's a ton of free resources on YouTube channels um, out there as well. But when I talk about movement patterns, it's very simple. It's push, pull, up, down, squat, hinge, single leg. Um, it, it's a very simple concept. And then you can manipulate based off of those concepts as well, too. But it, it, you can, feel free to, uh, I don't know if Adam can share or feel free to email me afterwards and I can, I can do some digging and set you up with some either our internal resources or do some external resources as well too to help you out. Awesome, thanks. Mark, where can people go to, to get to the EDGE program? What's the name of the website? It's abetterwaytotrain.com. Yep. Also, Matt, the other thing is getting some people's movement analyzed. So just having someone do movement training um, it's not going to be hurtful, but it really helps when it's specific to the movement issue that they're having. And that's harder to do. Like it's hard for someone to say, well, what issue am I having? So sometimes you need a skilled eye to look at that and say, Hey, this is the movement challenge that you have. And this would be the specific corrective to help combat that similar to what Mark was talking about with Rosie's hip. Um, you know, if you don't know that he could just do general movement training, like a dynamic warm up. It's not going to be harmful, but is it going to be as efficient as if someone looked at that hip and said, this is the area that we need to address. Yeah. Something that I, something that I will never do is if someone says to me, Hey Mark, can you write me up a program? If I've never seen this person or talked to this person or done an eval on this person, I will not send a program out to them because prescribing a movement or prescribing a, an exercise is like a physician prescribing a medication. If you give the right thing to the right person at the right time, you get a, a good response. But if you give the wrong movement to the wrong person at the wrong time, you can very easily have a negative response. And that's why, you know, resistance training and movement training sometimes gets a bad rap because people don't know how to administer um, programming correctly. So it's pretty easy to do once you do a quick evaluation. I mean, I could have someone send me a video of them doing a couple of different movement patterns and I would be able to do it quickly, but I would never just do a cookie cutter program and give it them out to them. Um, that would apply to TIGs in her field. That would be applied to a dietitian. Just be like, here, follow this nutrition plan without really learning what's going on with your particular physiology. Well, Mark and TIGs, thank you so much for all your time and everybody that's, that's stuck around 
You guys have been great. Thanks for your participation and all the great questions. Um, Mark and Tiggs, is there a place, I know you said a better way to train.com, but what about social media that, that um, some of these participants can follow you if they want more information? You can follow us on Instagram as our primary uh, vehicle for that. You can follow us at The Edge Sport. Uh, we also do have a Facebook page as well, too, but if the fun stuff's on the Instagram side of stuff. And if anybody has any questions about any remote or online training or just has some general questions, you can email me at info at a better way to train .com and I can send you some stuff based off of that. 